ATC will figure it out. A pro- our departure can talk to the tower very easily. If you didn't respond to the switch, uh, approach can call the tower, say, hey, did that guy come over? Yep, he came over. Done. It's done. There, you don't need to fret about it. You don't need to worry about it. Just do what you think you need to do, and we'll figure it out. Ready. This is Opposing Bases Air Traffic Talk. Your host, Romeo Hotel and Alpha Golf, have a combined 40 years of aviation experience as pilots and air traffic controllers. They answer your questions and share their opinions about flying and air traffic control. This show is not official guidance and should not be used as a replacement for your instructor, your pilot examiner, the endless books of regulations, your favorite comedian, your neighbor, your spouse, or your cat. November 628 Charlie Delta Squawk 1200, frequency change approved. The audio will be available on live ATC. Good day. November 643 Juliet Mike, third visual approach from way 23 left, connect hour. November 3222 Yankee, area of heavy to extreme precipitation, 10 o'clock to 1 o'clock, 15 miles, 7 Radiant miles. Uh, 3047 Charlie, try a departure, radar contact, climb and maintain. November 747 Sierra Lima, reduce speed to 180, you're overtaking traffic ahead on fun. Skyhawk 77 Tango, IFR cancellation received. Squawk via far, frequency change approved. Sierra 720 Fox, Tron Alpha, flatting 190 vectors for the visual approach. Skyhawk Runway 23 left. To enter triad class Charlie surface area from the east. Maintain special. Charlie Fox, Fox Golf Fox, Tron Alpha. This is triad approach on guard. You are being intercepted. The border is still closed. Say intentions. Please welcome your favorite controllers, Alpha Golf and Romeo Hotel. It's Monday, July 5th, 2021, episode 184. On today's show, we'll discuss a pilot's timely decision to declare an emergency with air traffic control and return to the airport. What's up, AG? Hello, hello, everyone. Hmm, happy July 5th. Yes, the weekday of observance. <laughs> yes. I guess. The house is full of people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. That was the fourth. Did you see some fireworks? Uh, no. No? Mm-mm, no. Kids didn't want to see them. They said, we've seen a, you've seen one firework, you've seen them all. So they... <laughs> all right. We weren't going to drag them out. I said, fine. No, we won't go. Right. We lit sparklers on the deck. Mm, smart. Local. Yeah, we got really crazy and did three at once one time. Mm. Yeah. It's pretty powerful, yeah. Nice. <laughs> yeah, we saw some neighborhood fireworks. Somebody mm-hmm. went to the neighboring state to buy them, where you can get mm-hmm. all the sorts of ones that are not necessarily legal here. Right. <laughs> yeah, yes. and terrorize the neighborhood. It was pretty cool. It was like an hour show, too. Dang. Yeah. That's cool. Someone asked in the chat room if I flew this weekend, or if anybody flew. Maybe that was to everybody. I did not have any cool flying this weekend, did you? (laughs) No. No. When do you fly next? Uh, This weekend. Oh, good. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Nice. At Hotel Romeo Juliet Airport. Hmm. Oh, because you're temporarily... I thought you were moving to the other one nearby. Uh, Nope, that fell through. Apparently, hangar space was at a premium. Hmm. That you were uh, we, uh, that the army was unwilling to pay. That's basically it. <laughs> yeah. And so we're at Harnett County. <laughs> okay. Uh, which is really not a a lot different in terms of driving for me. Oh, good. Uh, but yeah, I was at uh, Pope uh, last week, and the runway is completely a shambles. Oh. I sat and watched the operation for a second, and it is pretty impressive the amount of material they can move continuously Mm. Mm -hmm. and the mountain of concrete they're creating. I I guess they're going to recycle it. I don't know exactly what's going to happen, but it's pretty crazy to see the runway in in the form of a giant mountain. (laughs) Mound. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. 
I mean, are they, do they truck it away, or are they actually? You think they're keeping it local to use the aggregate again? Uh, you know that I'm not sure if they're going to use it again for that or not. But they're trucking it not far. I mean, maybe a quarter mile from the runway mm. and making a huge pile of it. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, you well, remember when they were doing ours in the trucks? How many trucks there would just be in line waiting to get filled up? I'm pretty sure we had every truck that was available <laughs> in probably the eastern seaboard. Yes. Yes. <laughs> same trucks and the same company that was used to haul in the dirt to make our runway 100 feet higher off the ground during construction. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, if they would have coordinated those two projects, they could have just hauled uh, all of Pope and Army Airfield up to <laughs> try <it. laughs> Yeah. All right. I don't have any other flying chit chat. I don't. I don't either. All right. We shall begin then. All right. Ready. Since OB one eighty three, we have a few new patrons: Juliet Kilo and Fox Truck. Fox Trot, our new and the show supporter tier. Bravo Whiskey, who's in the chat room, increased his pledge to the show maker tier. Thank you. Thank you. And we have a new Supreme Galactic Aviation Commander, Whiskey Bravo. Thank you, everybody. If you'd like to learn more about supporting the show, check out patreon.com slash opposing the bases. And if you haven't done so already, pull out your podcast player, swipe up, give us a five-star review, hit follow or subscribe, depending on which one you use. Drop. If you have time, give us a review. We'd appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Boop, 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 boop. Terrain, terrain. Oh, ah. Reviews and announcements. No reviews. <laughs> mm, I'll get the review this time. Okay, go ahead. Learn While You Laugh, five stars by Captain Ron. <laughs> the comedic duo of RH and AG will have you laughing, but it's not just good humor. You will learn technical details of flying from two very experienced pilots who also work on the other side of the mic as controllers. They have a unique perspective as such, as such and are young enough <laughs> as to not be old Grizzled, grumpy controllers. Captain Ron, Romeo Whiskey Kilo. Thank you, Captain Ron. Mm. Very nice. How much again, longer until again, we turn Again, we in? have succeeded in fooling everyone. <laughs> because <laughs> we're definitely grumpy. Grizzled and grumpy. The reason yeah. we don't record the show on Thursdays is because that's when I'm grizzled and grumpy. Yes. That's a bad day. Towards the end of the week, I would have plenty of... <laughs> Oh, I have plenty of complaints. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Go ahead with the announcement. That was uh, based on a longer email, but go ahead. Okay. Uh, announcements. Yes. Okay. Julia Charlie shared a link about fixing the NOTAM system. If you have time, check it out. I did have time. And here's a snippet, which is actually from uh, the final NTSB report about um, mm. some incident. Uh, that concern notums. Mm -hmm. And here it is. Concerns about legal liability rather than operational necessity drive the current system to list every possible noticed airman that could, even under the most unlikely circumstance, affect a flight. I feel like in other terms, we've heard that statement before somewhere. Mm -hmm. mm, somewhere very close to where we are now. The current <laughs> system prioritizes protecting the regulatory authorities and airports. It lays an impossibly heavy burden on individual pilots, crews, and dispatchers to sort through literally dozens of irrelevant items to find the critical or merely important ones. When one is invariably missed and a violation or incident occurs, the pilot is blamed for not finding the needle in the haystack. That's from the NTSB. I know. It's, it's insanity. It is. Yet yeah, here we are. Here's my suggestion if anybody's listening and cares what my opinion is on it. I understand that you're trying to push all the information out, and that is the source of the data that the pilots need. And there's a ranking, probably a spectrum of importance. You know, a runway closure, an airport closure. Let's just say those rank very high. But then there's stuff that doesn't matter. For example, Unlit towers below 100 feet AGL that are more than a mile from an airport. I don't care. 
Yeah. But those lines are presented in the same fashion. So here's my suggestion. If there are people that are actually working on this, why not have a, an agreed upon standard to rank them by importance and place them in prominent places based on how important they are to the safety of that flight? You shouldn't leave it to somebody who doesn't know anything about the NAS. They're just saying, hey, this is my notum. Put it in there to decide that theirs is more important. Let that be up to the experts and come up with some sort of tangible way to to rank them so that when I am looking at a release or a captain is for an airline and they have 15 minutes before they push and it's 50 pages of information, how about the first two are the ones that will kill them? How about those? Right, right. Or yeah. somebody at that company ranks them and says, you know what, all this other stuff is great. You can read this on the way. It's, it's not going to be a make or break. I don't know, but maybe uh, they're not listening to me. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't disagree at all. You're not suggesting to, to remove any information. We're keeping it all in there. We're just no. reordering it so that the stuff that actually matters is in the front. Right. Or I somehow mean. coded where you know, you know, some, I don't know if it's something simple like a numbering system or a color-coded system, something that makes logical sense to a pilot when they're reviewing it. And, and present it in a way that helps them determine what part of this book do I have to read right now and instead of feeling like I'm missing the needle in the haystack. That's the worst part. Right. All right. Julie, Charlie, thank you for sending those. You did ask for us to solicit the help from our audience. So if you are if you have time and you want the Notum system to be fixed, check out the links. They'll be in the show notes. Thank you. Timely feedback. Hmm. What do you want? Odds or evens? There's no, I just did that that hmm. thing. And that your rant was on your own. You did that on your own, so <laughs> Okay, number one. <laughs> From Charlie Charlie. Hi guys, I really appreciate your podcast. Please do a quick follow up on the Mayday podcast. As an aircraft owner and as a former flight school owner, I would like to know how was the plane removed from the field and if you know by now, what happened to the engine? to cause the problem with the power. Thanks very much, Charlie, Charlie. Well, conveniently, we do have an update. We have mm -hmm. audio from the episode. Here you go. Hey, AJ and RH, this is Bravo Foxtrot from Metroplex Executive. Um, considering going by Mayday Bravo Foxtrot, love to know what you think. Anyway, quick update about the incident we discussed on a special episode called Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. Uh, we finally found out what happened with the issue with the 150 that um, we had the precautionary landing in the field. Uh, it was a magneto issue. Uh, initial tests showed everything normal, but when uh, heated up to operational temperature, especially that of a warm summer day, uh, the mags failed. Not just one, but both magnetos failed from what I understand. So yeah. Um, God, we got figured out there wasn't something more serious. So the airplane, from what I understand, is going back into service, just not with my company. But uh, it's always good to see an airplane get back in the air and no one else get hurt because we found out what it was. Anyway, um, hope all is well. See you guys later. Thank you, Bravo Foxtrot, for the update. For those that don't know, without getting too deep into the weeds on systems, no magnetos, no proper ignition, no bang bang in the engine. No. <laughs> That's not good. You need those. Yes. Uh, we did not answer one of your questions. I believe that airplane was put on a trailer with wings removed and brought back to the airport where it sat. Uh, this is on a, this is a good outcome that they found. You know, general aviation airplanes typically don't have any sort of data recording to determine what happened. Uh, so you know, like when you car take your car to the mechanic, cannot duplicate. <laughs> yeah. Well. I'm not going to take it up in the air to see if we could duplicate it there. So luckily they found it. <laughs> We're going to tow it up. <laughs> and like it's a, a relatively, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a relatively simple problem. Uh, you know, there's something mechanical that can be fixed and that's a good outcome. We know there was something actually wrong with the plane and, you know, it wasn't some fluke. So thank you for sending that in. Hopefully we answered your question. You want number two? Number two. From uh, Lima Alpha. Hi, guys. Over the years, I've heard y'all discuss the urgency called Pan Pan. 
a couple of times on the podcast and described its use in maritime and aviation context. Listeners are probably now familiar with its pronunciation as the common pan, but we should also be aware of the other common pronunciation as pawn. I'm guess. guessing. Yeah. Pon 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 in, in case <laughs> the latter ever comes through the speaker. The word is derived from the French, as are many words of maritime origin. Uh, word pane, pronounced pane e, I guess. <laughs> or the pane in Indian tribe, translating <laughs> to broken, breaking down. Okay. All right. So it's from the French. Mm. U.S. Coast Guard radio operators f- frequently issue the pan pan call uh, to all stations to alert boaters to be on the lookout assist uh, with urgent situations and always stylize the pawn pawn pronunciation the wikipedia entry for pan pan has a pretty long list of its uses in an aviation context that are interesting examples a warning call of even less urgency securite Maybe. Seems say French, courte, which the Coast yeah. Guard verbally stylizes as say curate. <laughs> say curate, say curate, maybe. <laughs> How did I get this one? <laughs> it's, it's <used> <laughs> My evil plan. <laughs> ah, is used to warn receiving stations of hazardous conditions, weather, navigation issues, obstructions, etc. I've never heard nor read of the use of securite in the aviation context, but it seems that it could be a useful attention getter in sector level communications. Have mm. y'all ever heard its use? No. Mm-mm. No, but I'm definitely going to use it next time. Yeah. Thanks for the. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so, what? What did that guy say? Yeah, whoever's saying that, you're on guard. Thanks for the podcast, and thanks for visiting us at Wings of Carolina Flying Club. RH, hope to see more of you both. Cool. Well, we've deepened our knowledge of Pan Pan. Mm hmm. Or Pan Pan. Yes. Thank you for providing us with the uh, play by play on how to pronounce those words. Sometimes those are actually harder to read. <laughs> oh, oh. At least we're acknowledging that. <laughs> have you ever called another sector and said break for control uh, uh yes does it work because it's not it has not worked for me i've has had to did. say it at least twice <laughs> uh i don't know if it worked or not i i think more it was just me being irritated mm. <laughs> oh in your monotone break for control yes <laughs> Uh, yes, it may have been important. I don't, I don't remember. Mm. I thought it was important at the time, mm. and it was most likely local who didn't think it was important and was oh. tending to their, I don't know, pattern work or some such. Speaking nonsense. of local, we just did an episode, <laughs> uh, you and I, where we talked about the, the, the scanner beeping, and mm-hmm. sh- that exact scenario unfolded <laughs> with you and I. <laughs> Okay, so I was on local. I did scan the ticket, but it was on a it was on a screen that I didn't notice where I was supposed to type in a heading, and instead of giving me a you know a weird error beep, it it sounded almost normal. I think it was almost like a it might have been a single beep. Yes. So I but it doesn't actually send the strip down. Yeah, AG's on radar. No strip has arrived. He's looking (laughs) around, going, "Who is this?" And then he realizes it's me. And you had to have rehearsed it because it was done perfectly. (laughs) <laughs> you, you so politely said oh i never got that strip for that guy oh i said don't go anywhere hold on i want you to hear this and then when i scanned it it was yeah it sounded like it had never gone but i said it's stuck on a screen so that was a scenario that we hadn't discussed that is that is one yes uh so i cleared the screen i scanned the ticket and everybody was happy but I thought everybody would get a kick out of that. And I I knew I would forget to say something about it, but it was my mistake. AG was very nice about it. Hmm. I think I was being held over after the mid. 
Oh, uh, yeah. Under the worst of conditions. <sighs> Don't even get me going on that. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. Shall I get number three? Uh, yes, please. From Patreon Echo Charlie about his recent sim recurrent training in the Falcon. Cool. Is he in the chat room today? The international procedures course over the North Atlantic was like drinking from a fire hose. I had no idea that an oceanic clearance was completely separate from a normal clearance, and you don't always get it on the ground. I did not know that either. Did you? Uh, I was looking for Echo Charlie in the chat room. I oh. missed what you said. <laughs> uh, the Atlantic clearance, uh, the oceanic portion of the clearance yeah. for a, a European flight, for example, isn't always given on the ground. You may not get it until later on in the flight. Oh. I didn't know that either. He continues, of course, once we were past equal time point, which is the turnaround point, and it's a consideration for fuel and engine failures and a whole long laundry list of considerations, we developed a severe fuel leak. <laughs> you know, these Sims are terrible. It's got to be traumatizing. Uh, yeah, it really <laughs> is. All right, so here we are halfway across the ocean in time or distance, whatever you're picking, I'm not sure. And went through, that. now they give them a severe fuel leak. All right, so they're not going to make it back. They went through an exercise on how to ditch the airplane. They showed us how to predict where we're going to be almost out of fuel so we could ditch under power. Okay, that makes sense, I think. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And broadcast the coordinates over VHF, HF, and CPDLC. All right, well, there, there you go. There's a real good reason. We need power to do all through all those things. They also shared a website that I guess you have access to up there, vesselfinder.com, so we could see where all the boats are and try to get close to where they were. I had no idea mm -hmm. how many ships were out there. Speaking of, they taught us that Pan Pan is typically used over water and in Europe, but there's no hard rules. Like you guys said, either Pan Pan or Mayday will get plenty of attention. All right, let's go back to the boat thing. That's pretty cool. Hey. Because if you're floating around the North Atlantic, even if your boat doesn't sink or your airplane doesn't sink right away, provided you have some sort of flotation device, you're probably pretty far away time-wise from anybody finding you. Yes. It will be I luck. mean, when you look at that vessel finder, it it looks like there's a lot of boats. Mm -hmm. But when you zoom in, like they're oh. pretty far apart. Right. So yeah. <laughs> aim your plane at one of them or close at to one of them. At a shipping lane, maybe. Yeah. Mm, that's that's terrible. So under power, you're going to spend the last few minutes going, they're never going to find us. This is <laughs> we're never going to be found. And it is cold. Mm. <sighs> Thank you for sharing that. That's a good you do not want to be in that water. No. Mm. It is cool that they're having you go through that exercise, though. Very cool. Yeah. yeah. I like it. All right. The last one is audio from Mike Kilo. I'll play that. Greetings, masters of the Marconi medium. Mike November Kilo from underneath the cheesesteak Bravo with a segment I like to call. So that's what that stands for. Aviation edition. <laughs> Today's lesson builds upon your comments in OB 170 something or other, where despite your best efforts to provide VFR traffic separations, airplanes you are not talking to seem to always find a way to get in the way. And includes the simple and effective tactic ATC employs to win this game of aerial hide and seek. Today's lesson, the B in class Bravo stands for, wait for it, bosom. As in, I will protect you with a climb into my Class Bravo bosom so that VFR traffic I'm not talking to can't get to you no matter how many times they turn towards you after I vector you. The lesson and accompanying auto come courtesy of a trip to Northeast Cheesesteak Airport from Boardwalk and Funnel Cake Municipal. Like any responsible ob -er, I was getting flight following from Cheesesteak Approach and had been previously cleared into the Bravo due to the lower shelves closer to the destination, but presently flying under a 3,000-foot shelf of the Bravo about 15 miles from my destination. Number 5-1 Sierra Whiskey traffic at your 1 o'clock and uh, 8 miles there southwest bound. That indicates 2,600 type unknown. Uh, we, I would uh, recommend it. 20 degree turn to the right to get behind them, or if you want to climb to 3,500 for a little bit, get above them. Uh, we'll go 20 right. We're looking for the traffic. Let's we'll see. Yeah, type unknown, not talking to them, so I just want to keep you away as much as I can. Actually, make it a 30 degree turn to the right. 30 to the right, and I appreciate it. November 5 on Sierra Whiskey, just keep 
you advise it right now you're 12 o'clock and uh, 7 miles. They are southwest routes. Again, I'll say in case 2,600. What's there with you, sir? What's it take? November 5-1 Sierra Whiskey, I would recommend a climb up to 3,000. That traffic's turning southbound now to stay out of the Bravo. Uh, I'll just try to climb up to 3,000 for a little bit. I'll keep you advised and I'll get you back down when you get out of their way. Up to 3,000. One's there with you. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Traffic 12 o'clock in now, six miles. Turning southbound now, still out to indicate 2,600. What's there with you, Roger? 510 Whiskey Century, we're uh, climbing above that traffic. He can proceed back uh, direct to northeast Philadelphia. Back on board. What's there with you, then? Yeah, sorry. Sometimes I uh, don't know what they're going to do. I just try to keep you away, and then they go right on you. Yeah, I'm not sure they know what they're doing either, but thanks for your help. In hindsight, I should have accepted the initial suggestion to climb to 3,500 feet, but being so close to my destination, the vector felt like the better resolution. Admittedly, it never dawned on me that putting me inside the Bravo was the simplest and most elegant way to keep us separated, but that's why you guys get paid the big bucks. Oh, and this is the 473rd reason why you should always get flight following. The safety of the Class Bravo bosom is not available to those that don't talk and squawk. <laughs> I love that feedback. <clears throat> but you see how much energy and work mm -hmm. is devoted to that guy that you're not talking to. Because mm -hmm. I don't know what he's doing. Yeah, so for every transmission, it was time spent looking at that portion of his scope when there are presumably better things to be doing. And it wouldn't it be great if he was talking to that airplane and he could say, what are you trying to do? Yeah, you know why don't do you want to be, do you want into the Bravo? Do you want to go around it? What what are you doing? We have right. airplanes out there that we don't want to hit you. Hmm. hmm. Wouldn't that be amazing if they had to talk to them? It would be. Where have we heard that? Get flight following. Hmm. Where have we heard that before? And it sounds like this controller would have been happy to provide it. Some Bravos underneath that low, below three thousand feet, they you may not have the chance to do that. They are probably close to a class bravo airport and maybe they were you know they're normally busy and they may not always have the chance to do that but it sounds like this one had plenty of time so yeah i mean after the initial call up and going through the you know i guess the pain of getting it set up and going through your intentions but then it you're going to reduce all of that workload later mm-hmm by by being able to tell the the next guy that comes along that's a conflict this is what he's doing or you can work the traffic in such a way that it becomes no factor at all and now right. there's no tra traffic transmission calls there's none of that there's no guessing we just know what everyone's doing mm -hmm. yeah that flight following advertisement brought to you by opposing bases <laughs> <laughs> Good, really good uh, audio feedback, though. Yes, one. thank you. All right, today's show topic is brought to us by patron Mike Bravo, who sent in audio. Hey, RH and AG, this is Mike Bravo from under the non French Bubbly Charlie. This past weekend was the first time I declared an emergency to ATC, and I thought I'd tell you about it. For weeks, I had planned to fly out for brunch with my daughter and wife for Father's Day because, well, your father, you get to make the call, right? <laughs> anyway, during the run-up, I got some roughness on the right mag, which I've never gotten before. If I don't quite lean enough after starting and have a long idle, there will be some roughness on the left mag, but I've never gotten it on the right. I ran the RPMs up a little higher, re-leaned, and the roughness was gone on the mag check. After another 30 seconds, I was full power rolling down the runway on a very humid Sunday morning. With only a 30-minute flight over flat midwestern terrain, I had planned to cruise at 3,000. And just as I was about to level out, the plane started vibrating like an out-of-balance washing machine. A quick glance across the gauges and everything was in the green, and even the tack had barely changed. With a high humidity and temperatures in the 70s, I pulled the carburetor heat to see if that was it, but there was no change. And I audibly said, oh gosh, but not quite in those PG terms. My wife said she wasn't scared until that point, so that's a lesson for me maybe for the next emergency, if there is another one. Because we had taken off in the opposite direction of our route with a short vector for traffic, I was only a few miles from the field, confirmed when I looked to my left. I made a turn direct back to the field and immediately declared an emergency to departure. 
One of the first things I noticed as I judged my, our ability to get to the field was the RJ in position for takeoff on our intended runway. Since I had altitude to lose at that point, I pulled power to my typical descent setting and the vibration immediately went away. By that point, the RJ had taxied to the next taxiway and pulled off. Departure asked if I wanted to switch a tower, and I have to admit, I hit the swap button to get back to tower before he even asked, uh, finished asking and reported in. They cleared me to land immediately on the same runway departed. With a daughter and wife who actually enjoy flying with me, I decided not to try to troubleshoot in the air to avoid scaring them any further for future flights. Seeing my daughter nervously twirl the loose end of her lap belt, I reassured her that we would make it back to the airport, even if the engine quit completely at this point. We landed without incident, and everything ran smooth again in front of the FBO, no roughness at all. Even with that, I made the call that we go to brunch somewhere local instead, and we enjoyed the rest of our morning. As I reflected on the ATC handling, I th- thought in the moment that they could easily have cleared that RJ depart before me. Plenty of time, plenty of space. But then I thought about the wake turbulence. I don't know if that's why they had the RJ vacate the runway, but I'm glad the controllers did that instead of creating a big wake for my little Cherokee. One of my fellow co-owners is an AMP, and he pulled the plugs on Monday. Let's just say they showed every bit of the 500 plus hours they've been used, including the 120 hours since our last annual with very obvious fouling on at least two of them. We have new plugs on order, and I'm going to suggest we add 100 hour spark plug checks between annuals, even though we're not required to do so. I probably didn't need to declare an emergency, but I just heard you and others telling me in my head, just declare and focus on getting safely back on the ground. It'll work out. Anyway, I called the tower after we shut down and thanked them, and I'll put a general thank you out to all the controllers out there who work either on the radio or behind the scenes to help us out when things aren't going quite like we would prefer. Love the show. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Mike Bravo. Thank you for joining us in the chat room today and for sharing your story. Initial thoughts? Uh, good decision. Mm-hmm. So um, the switching over to tower, you know, quickly, uh, some people might feel like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Or ATC will figure it out. Mm-hmm. A pro- our departure can talk to the tower very easily. Um, and if you didn't respond to the switch, uh, approach can call the tower, say, Hey, did that guy come over? Yep. He came over done. It's done mm-hmm. there. You don't need to fret about it. You don't need to worry about it. Just do what you think you need to do and we'll figure it out. Well, let's talk about the, we'll figure it out. So he did declare an emergency. Let's assume everybody figured it out pretty quick. Let he's back on tower. What do we do up in the tower? As soon as we realize this is happening. Uh, you're probably going to stop departures. I mean, you're going to pull the crash phone. Um, you're just going to make sure the runway's clear. And that's part of what that CRJ, just instead of taking a chance and running a squeeze play. Right. Well, rule number one of an emergency. You you don't run a squeeze play. <laughs> no more. There's no <laughs> logic of trying to get another one out. No, no, it's, no, no, no. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. What if something had happened? You know, the RJ aborts. I mean, you just why risk it? Just get them off the runway. It'll be okay. If, even if they get a delay. And even if they did, as soon as they realize that you were turning around, they don't know if you're going to land opposite direction, which you very well could have, depending on your, you know, your position to the field right? and how much altitude you were losing, and how quickly you were losing it. So we're making a surface available to you. And, and like you said, I don't want another airplane stuck on it. I don't want to fling another bullet in your direction. Just right. taxi across the runway, get off of it. We pick up the phone. There's trucks rolling. They're probably already on the way at this point. The airport's effectively shut down, at least for the time being, until we figure out what's going on. So, Right. Yeah, because if we don't know exactly what the problem is, we're just going to try to cover all the bases. We're going to, mm-hmm. you know, we're going to remove any sort of variables that could create a problem. Mm-hmm. Another thing I wanted to talk about is your initial instinct. There's not many things you could do in this plane. It sounds like to troubleshoot car beats, one of them, maybe a quick fix. You had a short term memory of it having some roughness. So you know what, as you're pulling the car beat or going through that process in your head, making sure the fuel's on, I'm sure you looked at that, maybe didn't even realize it. You turn to put yourself into a down one, it sounds like you're going back towards the airport. There's a lot of pilots who may not think to do that right away. They may keep trucking in the direction they were going, afraid to say anything. Oh, I'll yeah. figure it out. 
I have my wife and my child on board. I don't want them to, to think something's wrong. Um, you know, if there's reluctancy for your family to get back in the plane with you after this, I hope it's they're you know, more excited to get in the plane. You do, you did the right thing. You did it quickly and you made the right call at the right time and you ended up on the ground fine. And to take the time to even, you know, mention the fact that, Hey, no matter what, we're getting back on this field at this point, it goes a long way into the yeah. memory that your child's going to have of that flight. And I don't know. I, I think this is a perfect example of making PIC decisions under pressure in an environment that you're not used to. You know, you don't go through, probably don't go through a sim every six months where they simulate fuel leaks over the Atlantic where you have to yeah, start right. thinking about <laughs> floating around for a few hours or days. <laughs> you know, so good for you. Um, I, I had some other notes on here. Go ahead if you had anything you wanted to say real quick. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Good job. I think you did. I think you did what you should have done. Yeah. Um, I know, I know what I wanted to mention. Another aspect from the air traffic control side, like AG said, we don't care if you're not there right away. So what you push the button, you're in a hurry to get back to, you know, the tower frequency, who knows if they cleared you to land or not, or if you said what you were doing, they probably did. I don't know if that was part of your explanation or not, but you know, they're, they're assuming that anything can happen at that point. Um, and we have said it, just declare the emergency, do what you got to do to get the airplane on the ground. And what we'll do on our side is make sure that that, that runway or area is available for you. And we're accounting for that. So, you know, don't worry about the administrative side of it until you get back on the ground and you can answer some questions on the phone and you may get a phone call later on. Looks like you got the example or the uh, reason the, mags were, or I'm sorry, the spark plugs were messed up. It looks like you were firing on three cylinders. That would make you vibrate. <laughs> yeah. Three out of four is not good enough. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know. I, I think this was a good example for people to realize that, you know, it, it doesn't have to take long. It didn't have to be a long drawn out scenario. It was, you know, quick and painless. Right. And I, and yeah. You don't have to job. be on fire. You don't have to have an engine failure mm -hmm. to declare an emergency. Something's not right. And you're in the air. Just get it on the ground. We will get follow-up questions about this, so I'll go ahead and ask it while you're in the chat room. Were you able to squawk emergency? And when you declared your emergency, what did you say? Hmm. We'll see if he answers that. Okay. As we're moving along. I don't have anything else on this one. I just want okay. I thought it was a good idea to talk about it for a few minutes and Tell everybody good job. I'd like you to announce or uh, pronounce the show topic banner that I have. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Declaration of Emergent Sentence Day. <laughs> that's pretty good. Uh, that's nice. I like that. Is that what he's out? Uh, he did not squawk 7700. Perfectly okay. You said it. Everybody knew what you were doing. I think that's, I, I was hoping that would be your answer. Not that mm -hmm. I'm saying you shouldn't do it, uh, but it's perfectly fine. Guess what? Everybody knew what you were doing because you verbalized it on the radio yeah. and everybody knew where you were. Now you're already talking to air traffic, obviously. So you taking the time to move your fingers and change that squat code was unnecessary. So. All right. Thank you. Mike Bravo, if there's anything you want us to touch on before the show ends, add it to the chat. Maybe we'll talk about it after the more after the show. Moving cool. on. Feedback time. Feedback. Where are we? Am I still on odds? You're, you're scrolling. Two's longer. You did. No, no, no. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, <laughs> I think you sort of did the last one. Okay. So you're, <laughs> so, so you're up. I'm up. Number one. From patron Kilo Foxtrot. Hello, AG and RH. Just wanted to stop by and say that I'm a big fan of the show and thank you for the work you guys do. I'm originally from the, or I'm originally from under the Windy City class Bravo, but I'm currently living in exile in Tornado <laughs> Alley as they work towards finishing initial tower cab training. Mm. Uh -huh. First day of practicals is June 14th. Okay. So cool. that, 
That already happened. Mm -hmm. Your show has been a great exercise in applying all the interrelated concepts that we have been studying. I've been listening since November, and I have been encouraging my classmates to check it out. Keep up the great work. Sincerely, an ATC wannabe. Cool. Well, I hope it went well. Yeah, send us an update. Let us know how it went at PAs. Practical, maybe he's talking about going to The Sims during that time. He might not be done yet. Maybe. Yeah. Keep us updated. Let us know how it went. Yeah, I don't know what PAs are. I mean, I know what physician's assistants are, Mm. but I don't know what reference. I don't know what they are either. Practical assessments, practical. Mm, That sounds probably correct. (laughs) Yeah. You never know. (laughs) Uh, It's like pulling out a notum and... You know, they're still using that archaic abbreviations that somebody can explain that. I'm sure there's a good reason for it that's no longer relevant, but we're still doing it. Well, because uh, since because we started it in 1909 <laughs> using those abbreviations <laughs> and ha- not having another system to use like English, mm. mm-hmm. which is clearly not available. <laughs> that's not... An available option. We just stuck with, you know, what we have. Oh, oh. All right. Send us an update. I want to know how you're doing. Number two from patron Delta Romeo Hotel. Hello, OB homies. (laughs) (laughs) I ran an errand today. Good feedback. All right. Number three. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) I have a different copy. (laughs) Oh, here it is. I. I, (laughs) Oh, oh. I ran an errand today and elected to fly my my Comanche up there. So I flew from up there. Does he mean up here? I don't know. I flew from ungodly hot desert city north to ridiculously ridiculous training airport in the southwest. Okay. Not to the triad. Both busy class deltas as I was getting ready to depart my return leg. The... FBL lost power as I was walking out. Once I fired up the avionics, I could hear ground was super busy, giving everyone very complicated, progressive taxi instructions as the main runway 21 left was shut down with a disabled aircraft. When it was time, I departed 21 right and headed and heard Tower ask a business jet where they were. And upon hearing they were seven miles out, gave them instructions how to get to the runway and gave them a landing clearance saying, you're cleared to land now, but be advised we lost all power and we'll be losing radios soon. Oh. Okay, this is definitely strange. They proceeded to ask multiple aircraft to give position reports as I assume they lost their radar screen. One ridiculous training aircraft was told, unable pattern work, we're about to lose radios. Hold over your house. I was out of the airspace <laughs> before they lost comms, so I'm not sure how it ended. My question is this. What happens once the battery backup fails? I assume that's what was keeping them on the air and not a generator because they were expecting to lose radios within about 20 minutes of power failure. You've talked about what happens to various airspace in relation to COVID closures in the past, but those facilities still have power. So can you at least set a recording on the AWOS saying the tower is closed so people know it's now E or G airspace like most deltas do overnight? I'm not sure what happens if there's no power to broadcast on the ATIS frequency. I guess it would be a little different for you guys as I've, as you also have a radar facility to deal with in the same building, but Deltas generally only have the tower. I'm not sure how pilots would react to hearing silence on all frequencies at a Delta they expect to be open as they arrive into the area or fire up on the ramp. Thanks to both of you, Delta Romeo Hotel. All right. There's a few questions in here. So at Triad, our radio our battery powered radios would be used in the case of an evacuation. We could take those uh, pet 2000s, I think is what they're called. That's probably a brand. And we could walk them out of the building and transmit to the airplanes in our airspace. And at, at our airport, it would be in an effort to sterilize the airspace. You know, no more departures would happen. Mm-hmm. We'd say clear to land. We would do our best to clear those runways and get airplanes on the ground. But we do have another uh, portion of the building that, in this example, if we were losing power to the building, we do have backup generators. For us to lose power would be sort of a catastrophic event. Yeah, something really bad. And yeah, yeah. Yeah, and the generators were out of gas or some <laughs> massive oversight. I mean, 
Uh, yeah, so in this case, the, the approach control in these Delta airports would be able to tell them, hey, the tower's lost power. It's class echo. So let's just assume they don't have power to broadcast the ATIS, which we could do that. We could put out an ATIS saying the tower's closed. It's been evacuated. It's class echo. So now you've got airplanes basically just reporting like a CTAF. Um, but if we have IFR arrivals, it's going to be one in, nobody out while we figure out the mess. We wouldn't be launching anybody else. Um, I can't imagine why we would think we had to launch anybody. They would just have to wait until we work the situation out. Uh, long term, I guess we could. We could just you know, treat it like a non-towered airport. Call downstairs for the release. But yeah. um, anyway, back to the original part of your question. <laughs> they, if they were assuming they were going to lose power and they didn't have generators, yeah, those batteries aren't going to last forever. Right. Um, so tell the overlying radar controller, say we lost our power, and then they'll they'll handle that from a you know they'll treat that airport just like they would a non-towered airport, and and fling airplanes off to advisories. Tell them to use. I think our our local frequency is not our CTAF, is it? It's a different published frequency. Yeah, it is different, I think. Which is weird to me, but um, <clears throat> yeah, it's published. I think that's what you're looking at right now. Yeah. Let me go through here and make sure I didn't <clears throat> miss any of your questions. Yeah, as far as the initial transition from people working in an operable tower to no one being there, that would be weird. Um, but if you're on CTAF, or you went back to the approach control, someone's going to eventually tell you they're evacuated the tower, they're not there anymore, or they, they lost power. If you were the only one, broadcast uh, your intentions on CTAF. Most pilots, I think, would instinctually, unless you had an emergency and, and you're at a controlled airport where you couldn't get a hold of the tower, maybe I'm making a big assumption here. I think most pilots would probably get out of the Delta and, and go somewhere else until they figured it out. Is that fair? I think so. I probably wouldn't want to land at a Delta without. I would think my radio was the problem. And I, if I couldn't see any light gun signals, I would bug out. I don't know that I would stick around. Yeah. Um, what, most likely, there's going to be you know, somebody on frequency that right. has heard the tower you know, mm -hmm. is about to lose comms. Mm -hmm. And it's going to revert to CTAF calls. And then when somebody new comes in... To call the tower, mm -hmm. they're gonna say, "Hey, tower is closed." Right. Uh, we're using CTAF. I uh, I don't see a CTAF. Mm -hmm. It might be in the facility directory for the chart, it might the chart be. supplement. But that's funny. Yeah. We don't know about our own airport. This came up in the last couple of years at some point for some reason. This is such an unlikely scenario. I mean, right. Because we have a backup generator and we should not run out of when we go off of commercial power and go to generators, it's a big deal. Everybody knows it. We're right. probably ATC alert at that point uh, to let everybody in surrounding know that we're one more malfunction away from not having ability to transmit or any power. So, right. Right. But even that swap over is like the lights kind of flicker one time mm -hmm. and you're like, mm -hmm. oh, what was that? And then mm -hmm. it's completely seamless. I mean, yeah, but it only happens when tech ops is available. It never happens on the weekend or during the midnight shift. No, it's not allowed to happen then. No, it doesn't happen then. <laughs> no, we don't do, we don't do unplanned failures in such a manner. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good question. Thanks for sending that in. And for the funny airport names. Yes. You want number three? Number three from... Romeo Mike, hello, AG and RH. Great show with the local instructor that handled a difficult situation very calmly, cool, and collected. Unbelievable job getting that airplane down safely and keeping with the emergency theme. My question is in regard to ATC services for a non-pilot co-pilot that is put in a position to get the plane down if something happens to the pilot i.e. a medical emergency. My co-pilot wife is currently taking some basic lessons for the purpose of getting down safely in the event that something happens to me. One of the first questions she asked, will someone on the radio help me? Typically, when her and I travel, we're on a long cross country on an IFR flight plan, and she knows that she can push a button and be speaking to ATC. She, she wants to know what can she expect from air traffic and how does the process work? 
vectors to an airport, frequency handoffs, advise instruction from a controller pilot or flight instructor, et cetera. Thanks and keep up the great work, Romeo Mike. This is a great question. This is something that I've, uh, I've thought about a lot, just what would happen in this scenario as a controller. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how do we work through this? Our facility is maybe unique. I don't know, but we have a fair, we have a pretty good chunk of people that have flown a, a small airplane mm -hmm. that at least have a basic knowledge of it. Um, we also have access fairly quickly. I would, I think to a flight instructor, um, mm -hmm. you know, on the field that could come mm -hmm. in to the building, you know, and be there as part of that, uh, assistance uh, package, I guess. Uh, as far as what we're going to do, yeah, vectors to an airport. Um, you're just going to have to talk through the, with that person in terms of what do they understand about the plane. Mm -hmm. You know, can I assign a heading or do I need to do a, like a no gyro type of thing? Turn right, stop turn, you know, start a descent, try to get them lined up with the airport. Um, yeah, it would be incredibly helpful if they at least knew how to land the airplane. Yes. That's mm. going to be the tricky part. <laughs> yeah. And really figuring out your comfort level of, of doing things. Let's just go back to the original question. What, what can they expect in a, a lot of facilities? They might not be anybody there, but if you're not clear on telling them what's happening, you know, say it out loud, declare the emergency, teach your, if she's worried about it and she's going to be a passenger all the time. And for some reason you're, prone to passing out <laughs> you know <laughs> right. make sure that not only does she know how to use the radio but she knows what to say when you key up uh, you know declare the emergency tell them what your call sign is and make her, sure she knows how to read that so everybody knows all right the pilot's incapacitated it's just me up here i'm not a pilot can somebody help you're going to get attention from people oh and yeah the room is going to scramble to try to figure out what help they can offer i like your suggestion on we do have a flight school nearby. We could probably get an instructor physically in the building um, at some places where maybe that's not possible. You could have an open phone line of talking to somebody. You could find the, the controllers who have to use their resources to get somebody that had a, some idea of how to fly an airplane to talk this person through this. And that would yeah. be, it would be tough. I know there's probably people out there who think they can do it, but when you're not in an airplane trying to tell people how to fly the plane, it's that that would be a very big challenge uh, right right they uh, there was a a case of this happening i believe it's been years ago mm -hmm. and it was in a king air mm -hmm. i think 90 maybe yep and uh they had a a plane go intercept mm -hmm. uh this king air and helped you know i forget who the the passenger was that was flying but helped to bring this plane in and, and they were able to land it. Um, you know, so that's, that's an option too. There's a lot of options. Hopefully, ugh, I mean, if you're IFR and you're up above a layer or something, that's going to add a lot of complexity. If there's an autopilot, that's going to be, that would definitely be a huge advantage. Yeah. Mm, there, but mm, yeah. So, this kind of plays into something I just saw on YouTube. There's a couple uh, YouTube channels. Uh, one of them is a, the pilot. He films all of his stuff in a Cherokee 6, and they're trying to get his, his wife proficient enough to land the airplane with the help of Jason Miller from the Finer Points. He's trying to get her to that point. And I just watched the video where the spouse, non-pilot spouse, who's a passenger, not necessarily the biggest fan of flying, sort of scared of it, but wants to be able to land in case something happened. Getting to them to the point where they know they can actually land the plane takes some time and some instruction, but that will be another suggestion I would put out there is don't just leave it to chance. If you're, if, if they're actually worried about that, you know, if maybe they don't want to be a pilot and get rated, but if they got to the point where they soloed, they're going to be pretty proficient at flying that plane. If all you had to do was solo them, you know, maybe 10, 15 hours in the airplane of instruction, it's worth it. If, if something ever like this ever happened and you needed to get down, so... Right from the air traffic side, I would beg every controller out there to use your resources. Don't just throw your arms up in the air and say, "I don't know what to do. We don't know how to fly." 
try to find somebody, try to find a way to communicate with them. There's other pilots in the air that may be able to stick around on frequency and kind of walk them down. Yes. Use those resources, but don't just give up and say, I don't know, uh, aim this way and there's the airport. You have it in sight. No, no, it's going to take more than that. Yeah. Oh, I guarantee in our airspace at any given time during the day, there are at least 17 CFIs flying around. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They're everywhere. Mm -hmm. Just make an announcement. Hey, is there a CFI on board? We have an emergency. Mm -hmm. Somebody needs help flying a plane. I guarantee there's somebody. And we can find a way to isolate you on a frequency, whether it would be guard or a frequency we don't use. You guys can have your own place to communicate and, you know, us be riding along. In an emergency, we can improvise too. Whatever it takes to get you down on the ground safely. Yeah, we can open another sector, shed every plane to that sector except the emergency plane, Mm. the CFI plane, whatever it is. And it's just us on the frequency. Yeah. Yeah. But go back to the beginning where something happens and she realizes that she's by herself. Be clear. Get somebody to acknowledge it. Have a normal conversation with them. Use plain English to tell them what's happening so they understand what they're dealing with and and the challenges. You know, describing where you're at uh, weather-wise. Can you see the ground? That type of thing would be important in this situation. How much time do you have in this plane? Are you comfortable maneuvering with the controls? You know, what any knowledge you have of what's happening, you know, Airspeed wise, altitude, do you know how to read those things? Because we have to have a conversation with you and it helps to know that you have an idea of what we're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Have a rudimentary, you know, skill level in communications. Just the concept of the back and forth, the maybe the call sign, that would be incredibly helpful, Mm -hmm. you know, just to make communications a little bit more clear um, about who's talking, Uh, you know, just... And even even a mild confidence in making radio transmissions mm-hmm. would go a long ways. Go a long ways. Yeah. Good question. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is it my turn for the last one? I think so. Oh, is this the last one? Yeah. Oh, huh. all right. From Kilo Charlie, recently found your show after asking a few people from a subreddit on how I can learn what the other side of the radio is like, currently working on my private pilot. Cool. I started training out of Triad and Mm. recently moved to Coffee Bravo, an airspace around here where my new school is located. It's complicated to say the least. There's, of course, the Bravo Coffee Bravo airspace that covers the bulk of the area, but underneath that umbrella exists two gigantic deltas that are busy. Delta at least sits almost entirely under a section of the Bravo with a 3,000-foot floor. That's relatively low for those who don't know. But the other Delta uh, sits under the 1,000-foot floor. That's basically jamming you to the ground, (laughs) making pattern and approach departure intersections are interesting, to say the least. To make matters worse, final approach for both uh, the big Bravo and the Delta overlap. Maybe look at that sectional. It's a bit confusing. I understand this airspace is confusing. I get it. Uh, I could be misrepresenting something. There are actually VFR procedures for one of the deltas because the airspace gets so complex. So long story short, how do controllers in a setup like this coordinate their activities? Or is there any coordination here? And what can I do as a pilot to make controllers' lives easier in a beehive like this? By the way, I love the podcast. I learn something new every episode. It's been super helpful while I'm in training. Also, thank you for everything you and the rest of the Triad Air Traffic Control crew do in putting up with us students you guys made training out of the triad super enjoyable well thank you for that we'll pass that on hmm. you just must have been there on the right days yeah, you... <laughs> and missed all the people that make it completely unenjoyable <laughs> uh, so we've i don't know if we've talked about this in a long time the maps that the pilots see the bravos the deltas the delineations between what you perceive as their airspace and someone else's airspace Mm -hmm. oftentimes don't look anything like the way we see it in a TRACON and the way our letters of agreement are set up between or SOP between up and down and approach and and tower. So there's likely room built into these agreements so that the, especially the thousand foot shelf has some, some wiggle room, um, some latitude to be, you know, maybe a little bit of airspace inside that Bravo so they can operate pattern work and not have to coordinate or point everybody out. So it's, it's Delta controllers in a different building than the 
uh, overlying Bravo. And there's, there has to be something procedurally to allow the airports to, to work and have a little bit of airspace freedom. So as far as what you can do to make their lives easier, operate within the confines of that airspace under the, the control instructions you were given. If you're going to stray from that, you need to verbalize it. Um, there's probably local accepted practice on how far out you can go on certain patterns in certain directions. And that's all proceduralized between the, the facilities so that there doesn't have to be a phone call for every time you do a loop in the pattern. Um, go ahead. Yeah. I'm just looking at the airspace. Mm -hmm. It is pretty jammed up in there. And <laughs> yeah. the finals for the, the Bravo airport and the larger of the deltas, which is almost straight north mm -hmm. of the Bravo. I mean, that, that Delta airport is on a three mile final. If mm. the Bravo is landing south, <laughs> mm. it's on a three mile final. <clears throat> it <laughs> is. <laughs> mm. Yeah. What a mess. Yeah. I never really looked at it. <clears throat> I never really studied on it like that. It's a mess. Yeah. Um, yeah. Knowing, <clears throat> excuse me, knowing the local, uh, norms and procedures and just, you know, sort of understanding how this flow is working and it's all going to be dictated on which way the Bravo is landing mm -hmm. is going to be a, of utmost importance in making it run smooth. <clears throat> if you want to be the least amount of burden on controllers, know what the, what these procedures are, you know, just have them memorized. Yeah. And you could get a, a feel for that by listening to, you know, sitting in the airport inside without the power running, you know, get a handheld and, and listen to what's happening in the Delta and, and, get a feel for how they're maneuvering airplanes on mm. if they're landing south that is a challenge i wonder yeah. if that's a normal typical setup there or they usually depart north who knows um i feel like they normally depart south oh, okay when i've okay. ever gone out of there it's typically south but you know like, it could be wrong <clears throat> um yeah you, you could go so far as to either have a handheld if you had one or just live atc and mm -hmm. listen to that while you're looking at an, <clears throat> excuse me, at an ADSB feed, mm -hmm. and seeing what they're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I trained underneath a Bravo uh, for my instrument and beyond in my training, and it was part of our takeoff brief. We knew where the Bravo floor was, right? And, and you are not going through that. <laughs> you right. leveled off. So you're going to get better at recognizing the traps in an airspace and you're going to be able to look at a map after flying in that area and be far more confident in navigating, uh, without Bravo clearances with the assumption that you're not going to get one right away. So that would probably make you a better pilot in terms of airspace recognition and right. You know, when, when we flew a lot in the Bravos up in the capital region, mm -hmm. um, it really helped us to have a landmark associated with the different shelves. So once you are past this landmark, you're in this shelf and having <clears throat> some association with actual physical pieces of land or, or landmarks on the ground with the airspace and knowing when you can let down and when you can start up, um, and not have to be heads down looking at a map or a moving map and figure out, you know, exactly where you are and deciphering this and just having a really good idea beforehand in a map reconnaissance, <clears throat> excuse me, very congested, um, goes a long way in just making you more comfortable and being less saturated, mm -hmm. in, you know, in looking at a map. Cool. Thank you for sending that in. We have an active chat room today. We'll be over there in a minute. We do not have a new question of the week. We are going to be doing some weird recording this month. If you forgot, we'll talk about that in post. Pushing yep. the button to stop right. here. Uh, we do do some weird out of schedule recordings this month for vacations and upcoming air venture, which if you hadn't heard, AG and I will be there on Thursday, Friday, 
Saturday and early Sunday in the latter part of the week at AirVenture. We are doing a live show on Friday at 4.30 in the Forums Building 4 over near Show Center. Hopefully we'll see you there. I have not written a new commercial. If you want to check out a way to keep your headset free from dust and gunk, check out atcsax.com or pilotsax.com, S-A-K-S.com. Find a nice personalized bag to hold your headset. I have feedback in the show up to May 29th prior to that date. Read on the show or respond to via email if you missed yours. Let us know. AG, anything to add? I do not. Hmm, closing out, episode 184 of Opposing Bases Air Traffic Talk, Romeo Hotel. And Alpha Golf. Goodbye, everyone. Visit opposingbases.com where you can leave Romeo Hotel and Alpha Golf an audio or written message. Find them on Twitter and Instagram at Opposing Bases. Or send feedback directly to their inbox at feedback at opposingbases.com. The views and opinions expressed on Opposing Bases Air Traffic Talk are for entertainment purposes only and do not represent the views, opinions, or official positions of the Federal Aviation Administration, Department of Transportation, or the National Air Traffic Controllers Association. All show recordings are done on personal time and personal property. Actual air traffic recordings are from third-party sources, and no government resources are used in the production of the show. There is no nexus between opposing bases and the FAA or NACA. All episodes are the property of opposing bases and shall not be recorded or transcribed without express written consent. For official guidance on laws, rules, and regulations, refer to your local flight standards, district office, or a certified flight instructor. Opposing Bases offers this podcast to promote aviation safety and enhance the knowledge of its listeners, but makes no guarantees to listeners regarding accuracy or legal applications.